If you think about it, planning a trip is really not that easy. First you have to think about the country you want to visit, then get a plane ticket, figure out the transportation in that city, find the hotel that's affordable and in the perfect location at least. After all that, now comes the hardest part, planning the spots to visit. You have to deal with the places that need reservations, time schedules, entry fees, and find out the rules to follow. Or you could always book a tour if you don't want to deal with all that. But for me, I like planning. It's the freedom and adventure that draws me to it. So today is one of those days that really needs some planning, because we're going to explore the Vatican City. And since our hotel is a bit far from the Vatican, we needed to use the transportation system in the city. So we decided to take the bus. Before we left the hotel, I asked the receptionist which bus to take just to make sure we're on the right bus, because there are different buses for different locations you can take. But one thing the receptionist didn't tell us though, is how the bus system works here. It was hard to film in the bus, because it was packed and full of people. But let me explain how the bus works here as we got to our stop and started walking to our first location, that is before we go to the Vatican. So like any other city bus that I know, the moment you step inside the bus, if you don't have a city card, you can pay the driver in cash for the fare, which we plan to do, but that doesn't work here. I found out by talking to one of the passengers, you have to buy a bus ticket in selected stores that have a vending machine specifically for the bus. And once you've purchased the bus ticket and boarded the bus, you have to find this machine which is mostly located in the middle of the vehicle and stick your ticket in it. Anyway, that didn't happen, so we pretty much had a free ride. And what's crazy is that I noticed a lot of people didn't even pay. Well, the bus was so packed, you won't be able to get to the ticket machine anyway. So now that I've kind of explained that, like I said, we decided to get off the bus and see a few landmarks along the way to the Vatican. And the first landmark is this one. This is the pillar of Marcus Aurelius. Um, I think that's also Caesar. Marcus Aurelius is definitely not Julius Caesar. He was a Roman Emperor from 161 to 180. Although he had multiple conflicts and wars during his reign as Emperor of Rome, Marcus Aurelius was really remembered as a philosopher and his rule driven by reason. He was actually one of the most respected emperors in Roman history. His column is located here at the Piazza Colonna. It commemorates his victories over the Germanic tribes in the Danubian and Marcomannic Wars. It's really cool because um, there's a lot of engravings up there. The engravings, as I put it, are stories of the wars he's been in. The column is about 130 feet high, and the whole thing is made of marble, which is hollow inside, and has a stairway going up to the top. I don't think the stairway is open to the public though. It's really nice. It's huge. Now we're gonna go and have coffee, or breakfast. Right around the corner, there's another pillar, right here. This stone pillar is called Obelisk of Monte Sitorio. It's an ancient Egyptian pillar made of red granite brought to Rome in 10 BC by the Roman Emperor Augustus. And right in front of it is the Palazzo Monte Sitorio, which seats the Italian Chamber of Deputies. So about breakfast, I found this place on my travel app claiming that they sell the best ice cream in the world. Well, they've been selling ice cream since 1890, but I didn't feel like eating ice cream for breakfast. Although I think I should have, since this place is known for ice cream, but we figured we'd get something else instead. We decided to get that one, which has is a croissant with some lemon inside. I've said this before, I don't really eat pastries or sweets for breakfast. If you'd ask me, I would want bacon and eggs, or even a steak. But somehow I don't think they have restaurants to open this early for that. So we ended up getting this croissant with some kind of lemon inside, and also these. Got ourselves some Nutella. It's chocolate. Uh, I think everybody knows what Nutella is. And then um, she got herself a little pastry. So I'm not sure what that is. It's a little pastry, yeah. And some coffee with milk. And of course, mine is a green tea. I'm gonna start with my coffee. I mean my tea. My tea in right here. Oh, yeah. I'm gonna try out this guy right here. It's kind of light. Mm. Not 
yeah, but I can smell the lemon. I hope there's lemon. There's no. There's a lemon right there. Mm. I think the whole thing is lemony. Even the bread? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe I, I can like break this open a bit. There it is. It's right here. Wow. Look at that. It's right there. See that? Mm. One bite. Mmm. Very creamy. Take a bite of this Nutella. It's, it's, it's still warm, although it's kind of cold right now. We're right in the middle of the street here, but. Oh man. That's a good bite. It's like, um, like a cake. It's hard. But it, uh, it's creamy. The Nutella is creamy. Very chocolatey. So after this, um, after we finish our breakfast here, we're gonna go straight to the Pantheon because it opens about 8:30. And it's already 8:30. It's getting close to nine o'clock, but because um, okay, I'll try this one too. This is just a lemon kind of a... Uh, lemon, I thought it was custard. Yeah, she thought it was custard, but it's lemon. I'll try it. Mmm. Oh, actually good. The bread is sweet. It kind of has like some sugar in there. And the lemon just, um, just kind of an added bonus. But, yeah. And then um, we need to hurry to the Vatican because we have um, the reservation at one o'clock. So we gotta be there at one o'clock just to get to the Sistine Chapel. So we just finish our breakfast and then go there, uh, the Pantheon first. I have to admit the breakfast wasn't that great. I mean, the pastries were good, but I wanted something more meaty. Anyway, like I said, we headed to the Pantheon, which was just a few blocks away from the cafe. Pantheon right here. So this is the Pantheon. I always get this confused with the Parthenon which is in Greece. Well not anymore. The Pantheon used to be a Roman temple dedicated to the Roman gods and was converted into a Christian church in 609. This ancient temple or church was built in the year 113 to 125 AD. Aside from being ancient, the Pantheon is known for its dome with a central opening to the sky it's actually the largest unreinforced concrete dome in the world, measuring about 142 feet in height and diameter. Today, it's one of the best preserved ancient Roman buildings and it's used as a church dedicated to Saint Mary and the Martyrs, as well as a burial site for the famous painter Raphael. That being said, millions of people continue to visit the Pantheon every year. We're gonna go inside because it's free. I guess we're just in time. Wow. Oh, beautiful. Oh my gosh. It's beautiful. Pantheon. Oh my gosh, look. It's like a big dome. Oh man. You're walking here. Oh my god. As you can see, the Pantheon is huge. Coming here, I wasn't really expecting this. I've always thought of it as having a rectangular shape and without a dome. 
Well, mostly because I've confused this with the Parthenon. But speaking of the dome, it's really amazing to think that the whole thing is unreinforced concrete. I mean, how does it hold? Especially with that hole in the center. This is it. I thought the Pantheon was like a straight line. But I guess it's like a cathedral. They turned it into a basilica? Oh. And I gotta do my homework here because it looks like um, I have a different idea of uh, the Pantheon. I didn't think it was a basilica. And it says a uh, basilica of the Santa Maria Martinez. But they have like they have like uh, paintings all over the walls. There are a lot of paintings and sculptures from the 15th century scattered all over the walls by known and unknown artists. You know, I read that the circular dome with a temple front was unique in Roman architecture before, but eventually it became a standard and has been copied by many architects throughout the years. So right here is the altar that was built in the early 1700s by Pope Clement XI. It's enshrined with the figure of the Virgin and Child just above the altar. But what surprised me, considering that this is a church and very popular, how come they only have a few benches for people to sit and worship? This is actually a functioning church where a mass still runs every Sunday at 10.30 in the morning and on Saturday at 5 in the afternoon. It's kind of weird, but I found myself feeling unsatisfied to leave the Pantheon. I mean, don't get me wrong, this place is amazing. I just think it's the fact that the Pantheon is too open. I mean, when you walk through the front door, you pretty much see everything in one scan. You don't need to walk through and around pillars. Everything's right in front of you the moment you walk in. I'm gonna walk right in the center. It's just an open space up there. Um, yeah, it's beautiful. It feels so weird just reading about it or planning it out, and I'm all right, I'm actually here. This here is the Eye of the Pantheon, or Oculus. It's the only source of light, and it's said to be the connection between the temple and the gods above, or the occasional rain that falls through it. But the floor directly below it is designed to drain the water from the two holes you see there. Like I said earlier, the Pantheon's architecture has been copied and has inspired several well-known buildings, such as the Dome of Santa Maria del Fiore in Florence, the Church of Santa Maria Assunta in Aricia, the Bell Isle House in England, the Thomas Jefferson's Library in Virginia, and numerous government and public buildings around the world. What I found out interesting is that the columns you see here were outsourced and had been shipped overseas. That's the Pantheon. And in front is this. When you get out of the Pantheon, this is what it looks like. This is in front of the Pantheon. This is the Fontana del Pantheon, or Fountain of the Pantheon. It was commissioned by Pope Gregory XIII. This fountain was designed in 1575 and is sculpted from marble. The fountain was modified in 1711, which included a basin made of stone, and the Makateo Obelisk, which is an Egyptian pillar from the days of Ramses II. The Pantheon is rich with history and definitely one of the top attractions here in Rome. It'd be such a waste not to see this if you're here, especially when it's free. Next, we're gonna have an early lunch, I guess. Yeah, we're gonna have an early lunch because um, we have to be in the Vatican by 1 o'clock. And I think it's around 10 o'clock right now. And um... Yeah, we'll find a restaurant to eat lunch. Early lunch. Okay, you know what? I made a mistake. We're gonna go to um, a square. It's called the Novana Square. And it's gonna be, I think, that way. The Novana Square, or Piazza Novana, it's a famous square here in Rome. Its existence began as an ancient Roman stadium called the Stadium of Domitian, built in the first century. If you notice, the square actually follows the form of the stadium. 
This piazza has hosted a lot of events and other public activities and festivals. And today I believe a Christmas market is held here every year. But the most prominent feature in this piazza is the Fountain of the Four Rivers. There are two other fountains here. You just saw the first one which was the Fontana del Moro. And the other is called the Fountain of Neptune which is on the other side. But this one is called the Fountain of the Four Rivers. This was designed in 1651 by Gian Lorenzo Bernini for Pope Innocent X. As you can see, the fountain is designed with four river gods, representing four major rivers. The Nile in Africa, the Danube in Europe, the Ganges in Asia, and the Rio de la Plata in South America. Right in the center is a copy of an Egyptian pillar. Oh, and right behind it is a building called the Palazzo Pamphili, which is the family palace of Pope Innocent X. This fountain looks really amazing, but that wasn't the case during the mid 17th century because it was met with opposition by the people of Rome all throughout its creation which is due in part of the intense famine at that time. People were protesting and writing messages that they would rather have food than another fountain. But still the fountain was unveiled in 1651 and a festival took place in celebration of this event. It's either they hide from my camera or they say hi. I didn't realize it until now that most cities in Europe, especially here in Rome, are littered with fountains. I never really gave it a thought as to why until I started researching places for my videos. Well, I found out that public fountains such as this one serve multiple purposes. One is that it's a source of clean water for people before plumbing existed. And another thing is that most of them are commissioned and dedicated to papal patrons at that time. But throughout the centuries all the way to today, Fountains has become more of a landmark or an artwork admired by people because of its history and of course it looks nice. Now we can find the restaurant to eat our early lunch. Cantina. So we're gonna decide to eat here. We wanted to eat here because this place was known for traditional Italian cuisine, but unfortunately they were still closed. You see restaurants here open at 12 noon and we couldn't wait until then because we had a tour reserved at the Vatican Museum. So we kept looking around to find a restaurant that's open. Look, they're still closed, but we really need to eat something. Yeah, they're also closed. They're gonna open at 12. After walking a bit, I spotted this place. It looks like they're open because the music was blasting inside the shop and the food was already on display. I didn't want to eat a sandwich, but I guess it's better than nothing. I walked in, the guy is still fixing it. He said they're gonna open in 10 minutes. Wow, they open really late here. But anyway, we're gonna have, probably have a late lunch uh, or early dinner later. And then um, after this, we're gonna go straight to the Vatican. Maybe hit up the um, cathedral, the angel thing cathedral. I guess they serve other foods here aside from bread. And these look really good. I know it's a bit early but I decided to get a beer and got myself this. I wanted local beer and this is what they gave me. So this is what I got. I know it's a salmon wrap. I just don't know what it's called. I'm not even sure if this is an Italian dish or something this shop just created. But it's a semi toasted tortilla with raw salmon, cheese and lettuce all wrapped up inside. I just had to get it because I don't think I've ever had salmon wrap before. And right next to it, we also ordered this. Now this one looks like a seafood pizza. It has shrimp, shredded lettuce, olives, grape tomatoes, cheese, and what looks like a thin layer of tomato sauce. You know what, who am I kidding? This is pizza. Alright, so the first thing I went for was the salmon. It was pretty meaty, packed with salmon, and it was still hot. It's actually smoked salmon and it was really good. I can taste the smoky flavor from the salmon and the lettuce along with what I think is a tortilla blends just perfectly well together. I just didn't taste the cheese though. Well after this bite I did. It's kind of hard to say what cheese this is but it's really creamy. The first thing that comes to my mind is goat cheese. It's not salty and it's not cheesy. I don't really know how to describe it but this wrap is really good. Now I'm going to try the seafood pizza. This one is kind of deceiving because it does look like pizza but it doesn't feel like one. First of all it doesn't smell like pizza and secondly it's just toasted bread with all these toppings on it.
Okay, this is definitely not pizza. The bread was nice and crunchy. The sauce is something I've never tasted before, and it was good. There is nothing really special about the shrimp, but the sauce is really something. It kind of tastes similar to Thousand Island dressing, but less sweet. Well, aside from the sauce, I really love the crunch on the bread every time I take a bite. So if you're gonna ask me which one tastes better, I would say the pizza. I mean the smoked salmon wasn't bad, it's just that the pizza had more flavor. I just love that sauce. Anyway, we didn't stay long here. We actually hurried and finished our food quickly because we had the specific time to be at the Vatican Museum for our tour. So as we walked towards the Vatican, we made our way to this bridge that we needed to cross. This bridge is called St. Angelo Bridge or Ponte San Angelo. It was built in 134 AD by the Roman Emperor Hadrian. The bridge is decorated with 10 statues of angels which were sculpted by some of the greatest sculptors at that time. For many years, this bridge has been used by people to cross the river Tiber and a way to reach the St. Peter's Basilica which is where we're going to. As you can see, there are many other bridges you can take to cross the river but I believe this bridge, St. Angelo Bridge, is the most popular one not only for its history and the beautiful statues along each side, it's also directly connected to the Castle of the Holy Angel. The Castle of the Holy Angel was commissioned by the Roman Emperor Hadrian. It was built in 123 to 139 AD. It was purposely built for the emperor and his family, but eventually it was later used by popes as a fortress in the 14th century. I've read that a special corridor was added to connect the castle with St. Peter's Basilica. Anyway, today the castle serves as a museum displaying various pieces of art from statues, paintings, ceramics, and most of them from the Renaissance period. My plan initially was to go for a tour in this castle, which by the way is about $18, then go to the Vatican after. But since we're short in time and our tour for the Vatican Museum was about to start, we wouldn't have enough time to see this castle and make it to the Vatican Museum. I figured since the castle is not far from the Vatican, we'll just come back here later if we have time after the tour. That's the Vatican right there. Well, first we're gonna hit the Peter's uh, Square first. Um, St. Peter's Square, which is I think it's somewhere right there in the middle. Hi guys, uh, there's so many people asking for tours and stuff. I don't know if it's um, legit. That's why it's really nice if you... It's advisable actually for you to book your tickets online like we did. Well, so far. Because um, we still have to figure out how things work over here. As we figure out where we should go to start our tour, right here we just entered the Vatican City. And what you see here is the St. Peter's Square, or Piazza San Pietro. It's a large plaza located in front of the St. Peter's Basilica, which is the building back there. This plaza was redesigned by Gian Lorenzo Bernini in 1656, with the hope to create a sense of awe from visitors and people of Rome when they see the Pope. There are 140 statues of saints located on the top of the colonnades surrounding the square, and at the center sits an Egyptian pillar, which has two granite fountains on its sides. This is the Egyptian pillar which is right at the center of this plaza. This pillar originally stood in Heliopolis in Egypt and sometime around the year 40 BC, it made it here in Rome. And it's only 1586 when the pillar was moved here, in its current location. Pretty awesome. That's where we came through. We're going to go ahead inside the... Well, actually, we're going to go to the museum first. And I um, really want to see the Sistine Chapel. It's 11 o'clock. And we're kind of early, which is good. We have time to figure things out, where the line is, where we get our tickets and all. So that's what we're going to do next. From the St. Peter's Square, you have to make a right and enter this if you have the Vatican Museum uh, online pass. They're really pushy here. They're really trying to sell you the tour, but our tour doesn't have like a guided tour. It's just a, our own personal tour. But if you don't know anything here, you get kind of overwhelmed, but we're just gonna still go for it, you know, just try to figure out how it works on our own. And um, like I said, we're still going for the unguided tour. 
So. Because <laughs> it's confusing. From the St. Peter's Basilica, you make a right and you go straight all the way back to the street and you go around. Because <laughs> I guess this is going to the ticket or the booth. To the ticket booth. We finally found it. Like I said, we got the unguided tour. But I think if you get the guided tour, they make it a lot easier for you. And you get a complete access from the Sistine Chapel to the St. Peter's Basilica without waiting in line. We're gonna go in here. See, if you have the voucher, you have to go here. Alright, let's do this. This is two tickets. We finally got our tickets. There's a lot of like, um, if you look down here, there's a lot of like gates and like ticket booths and stuff. And like back here, there's another ticket booth. But it's if you have a voucher online, you have to go up here on the second floor to get these. And right now it's kind of early because our tickets is at one o'clock. It's only like 12, but we're gonna try and get in. Alright, we are in! Now it's time to get lost. We don't have a map, we don't have anything. Oh, there's a map right there. You can get a map right here. We got ourselves a map of the museum and hopefully we can navigate from here. I think we're pretty good at navigating anyway. But the only problem is, is that after the Sistine Chapel, we have to go back around and go online for the St. Peter's Basilica, which is free. Um, if you want to go straight from the Sistine Chapel, you have to pay extra like 30 bucks or something like that. It's kind of expensive, but for us, we don't mind walking, so that's what we're gonna do. You can go straight here. Wow. Oh, there's a spear. That's something we're gonna go to later, but might as well. We're right here. It's an acorn. But the sphere is something that we have to check out because that's on um, things to see. Yeah. This sphere is called the sphere within the sphere. It was created by Arnaldo Pomodoro, who's an Italian sculptor. The sculpture is exactly what it's called. It's a huge bronze sphere that's cracked, revealing another cracked sphere inside. The sculptor says that the inner sphere represents the earth and the outer sphere represents Christianity. The design inside, which looks like gears or some kind of machinery, symbolizes the complexity and intricacies of the world. Oh, it moves. See, that girl's moving it. Wow. I guess she works here. I was really tempted to rotate this sphere, but I don't think you're allowed to. Well, anyway, it's time to start our tour with the Vatican Museums. We're gonna go upstairs and see what's up there. See this? What are those? So the Vatican Museums are basically art museums located within the Vatican City. Yes, I said Vatican City. You know, I didn't know this until now, that the Vatican is actually an independent city-state within Rome. Well, it's pretty much like a small independent country, which in this case is ruled by the Pope. The Vatican City is the smallest sovereign state in the world, both in population and area. It has about 1,000 people and the city is only about 110 acres in size. Within the city, you'll find the St. Peter's Basilica, the Sistine Chapel and the Vatican Museums, which I'm currently in tour right now. Anyway, about the Vatican Museums, as you can see here, displays massive amounts of artworks and collections amassed by popes throughout history. You'll see renowned Roman sculptures and masterpieces from the Renaissance period. The museum contains about 70,000 works and only 20,000 are on display. This place was founded in the early 16th century by Pope Julius II. It's one of the largest museums in the world with 54 galleries, and it's one of the most visited museums with 6 million people recorded in just one year alone. Yes. 
doesn't they write stuff and they just chisel or whatever they want to write down. It'd be cool if it says um, it translates what it says. So. Since we took a self-guided tour, I don't think we went to all 54 galleries. We tried our best to follow the map, and we did go through a lot of different galleries, but the gallery that I'm most excited to see is the Sistine Chapel. Unfortunately, the chapel is the last part of the tour, which was okay, because the exhibits along the way was really interesting and amazing to see. Well, here's what you'll see inside the Vatican Museum as we find our way to the Sistine Chapel. So the tour guides are always pointing to this sculpture. Must be important. And then, um, oh sorry. And then they started talking about that sculpture behind. There's uh, better lighting in here. Wow. Look at all this. Even the floors, I think, are old. Man, I'm ready for the Sistine Chapel big time. I'm so excited to see the Pieta. Or no, yeah. St. Peter's. Yeah, the Pieta is inside St. Peter's. Oh, look at this. It's a beautiful view of the city. Oh, it's nice and cool, finally. Going out here. Just looking for the Sistine Chapel right now. How do they paint that? It's getting tight in here. I don't know what kind of, what this bowl is for. A very thin shield. Armor. The shield is huge. Okay, now we're headed to the Sistine Chapel now. Uh, this is going to the yeah, this is going towards it. Must be significant because they enclosed this. Because you can't walk it. But. These are rugs. And big rugs. They um, represent something, all of them. are frescoes now. They're paintings. Oh my gosh, look how big that is. I mean, how can you proportion that painting? You know, if you're a person who really likes artworks and loves museums, the enormity and the vast collections of sculptures, paintings, and the artifacts here would take you probably a couple of days to appreciate and admire every single piece. But as for me, we finally made it to the end of the tour, which means I'm about to enter the Sistine Chapel. And it's just through that door going up those stairs. 